Frank by Francis Goodrick and Albert Hackett. Characters Mr. Frank, meet Mrs. Von Don, Mr. Von Don, Peter Von Don, Mrs. Frank, Margot Frank, Anne Frank, Mr. Crailer, and Mr. Dussel. Act 1, Scene 1. The scene remains the same throughout the play. It is the top floor of a warehouse and office building in Amsterdam, Holland. The sharply peaked roof of the building is outlined against a sea of other rooftops, stretching away into the distance. Nearby is the belfry of a church tower, the west of Torren, whose carillon rings out the hours. Occasionally faint sounds float up from below. The voices of children playing in the street, the tramp of marching feet, a boat whistle from the canal. The three rooms of the top floor and a small attic space above are exposed to our view. The largest of the rooms is in the center, with two small rooms slightly raised on either side. On the right is a bathroom out of sight. A narrow, steep flight of stairs at the back leads up to the attic. The rooms are sparsely furnished with a few chairs, cots, a table or two. The windows are painted over or covered with makeshift blackout curtains. In the main room, there is a sink, a gas ring for cooking, and a wood-burning stove for warmth. The room on the left is hardly more than a closet. There is a skylight in the sloping ceiling. Directly under this room is a small, steep stairwell, with steps leading down to a door. This is the only entrance from the building below. When the door is opened, we see that it has been concealed on the outer side by a bookcase attached to it. The curtain rises on an empty stage. It is late afternoon, November 1945. The rooms are dusty, the curtains in rags, chairs and tables are overturned. The door at the front of the small stairwell swings open. Mr. Frank comes up the steps into view. He is a gentle, cultured European in his middle years. There is still a trace of a German accent in his speech. He stands looking slowly around, making a supreme effort at self-control. He is weak, ill. His clothes are threadbare. After a second, he drops his rucksack on the couch and moves slowly about. He opens the door to one of the smaller rooms and then abruptly closes it again, turning away. He goes to the window at the back, looking off at the Wester Torren as its carillon strikes the hour of six. Then he moves restlessly on. From the street below, we hear the sound of a barrel organ and children's voices at play. There is a many-colored scarf hanging from a nail. Mr. Frank takes it, putting it around his neck. As he starts back for his rucksack, his eye is caught by something lying on the floor. It is a woman's white glove. He holds it in his hand, and suddenly all of his self-control is gone. He breaks down, crying. We hear footsteps on the stairs. Meep Gius comes up, looking for Mr. Frank. Meep is a Dutch girl of about 22. She wears a coat and hat, ready to go home. She is pregnant. Her attitude toward Mr. Frank is protective, compassionate. Are you all right, Mr. Frank? Yes, Meep, yes. Everyone in the office has gone home. It's after six. Don't stay up here, Mr. Frank. What's the use of torturing yourself like this? I've come to say goodbye. I'm leaving here, Meep. What do you mean? Where are you going? Where? I don't know yet. I haven't decided. Mr. Frank, you can't leave here. This is your home. Amsterdam is your home. Your business is here, waiting for you. You're needed here. Now that the war is over, there are things that... I can't stay in Amsterdam, Meep. It has too many memories for me. Everywhere there's something. The house we lived in. The school. That street organ playing out there. I'm not the person you used to know, Meep. I'm a bitter old man. Forgive me. I shouldn't speak to you like this. After all that you did for us. The suffering. No, no. It wasn't suffering. You can't say we suffered. As she speaks, she straightens a chair which is overturned. I know what you went through. You and Mr. Crailer. I'll remember it as long as I live. He gives one last look around. Come, Meep. He starts for the steps, then remembers his rucksack going back to get it. Mr. Frank, did you see? There are some of your papers here. She brings a bundle of papers to him. We found them in a heap of rubbish on the floor after... after you left. Burn them. He opens his rucksack to put the glove in it. But, Mr. Frank, there are letters, notes. Burn them, all of them. Burn this? She hands him a paper-bound notebook. Anne's diary. He opens the diary and begins to read. Monday, the 6th of July, 1942. 1942? Is it possible, Meep? Only three years ago? 
As he continues his reading, he sits down on the couch. Dear Diary, since you and I are going to be great friends, I will start by telling you all about myself. My name is Anne Frank. I am 13 years old. I was born in Germany the 12th of June, 1929. As my family is Jewish, we emigrated to Holland when Hitler came to power. As Mr. Frank reads on, another voice joins his, as if coming from the air. It's Anne's voice. My father started a business, importing spice and herbs. Things went well for us until 1940. Then the war came, and the Dutch capitulation, followed by the arrival of the Germans. Then things got very bad for the Jews. Mr. Frank's voice dies out. Anne's voice continues alone. The lights dim slowly to darkness. The curtain falls on the scene. You could not do this, and you could not do that. They forced father out of his business. We had to wear yellow stars. I had to turn in my bike. I couldn't go to a Dutch school anymore. I couldn't go to the movies, or ride in an automobile, or even on a streetcar, and a million other things. But somehow, we children still managed to have fun. Yesterday, father told me we were going into hiding. Where? He wouldn't say. At five o'clock this morning, mother woke me and told me to hurry and get dressed. I was to put on as many clothes as I could. It would look too suspicious if we walked along carrying suitcases. It wasn't until we were on our way that I learned where we were going. Our hiding place was to be upstairs in the building where father used to have his business. Three other people were coming in with us, the Von Dons and their son, Peter. Father knew the Von Dons, but we had never met them. During the last lines, the curtain rises on the scene, the lights dim, on. Anne's voice fades out. Scene 2. It is early morning, July 1942. The rooms are bare, as before, but they are now clean and orderly. Mr. Von Don, a tall, portly man in his late forties, is in the main room, pacing up and down, nervously smoking a cigarette. His clothes and overcoat are expensive and well cut. Mrs. Von Don sits on the couch, clutching her possessions, a hat box, bags, etc. She is a pretty woman in her early forties. She wears a fur coat over her other clothes. Peter Von Don is standing at the window of the room on the right, looking down at the street below. He is a shy, awkward boy of 16. He wears a cap, a raincoat, and long Dutch trousers like plus fours. At his feet is a black case, a carrier for his cat. The yellow star David is conspicuous on all of their clothes. Something's happened to them. I know it. Now, Carolee. Mr. Frank said they'd be here at 7 o'clock. He said... They have two miles to walk. You can't expect. They've been picked up. That's what's happened. They've been taken. Mr. Von Don indicates that he hears someone coming. You see? Peter takes up his carrier and his school bag, etc., and goes into the main room as Mr. Frank comes up the stairwell from below. Mr. Frank looks much younger now. His movements are brisk, his manner confident. He wears an overcoat and carries his hat in a small cardboard box. He crosses to the Von Dons, shaking hands with each of them. Mrs. Von Don, Mr. Von Don, Peter. Then an explanation of their lateness. There were too many of the green police on the streets. We had to take the long way around. Up the steps come Margot Frank, Mrs. Frank, Meep, who's not pregnant now, and Mr. Crailer. All of them carry bags, packages, and so forth. The star David is conspicuous on all of the Frank's clothing. Margot's 18, beautiful, quiet, shy. Mrs. Frank is... A young mother, gently bred, reserved. She, like Mr. Frank, has a slight German accent. Mr. Crailer is a Dutchman, dependable, kindly. As Mr. Crailer and Meep go upstage to put down their parcels, Mrs. Frank turns back to call Anne. Anne? Anne comes running up the stairs. She is 13, quick in her movements, interested in everything, mercurial in her emotions. She wears a cape, long wool socks, and carries a school bag. My wife. Edith, Mr. and Mrs. Von Don, their son, Peter, my daughters, Margot and Anne. Mrs. Frank hurries over, shaking hands with them. Anne gives a polite little curtsy as she shakes Mr. Von Don's hand. Then she immediately starts off on a tour of investigation of her new home, going upstairs to the attic room. Meep and Mr. Crailer are putting the various things they have brought on the shelves. I'm sorry there is still so much confusion. Please, don't think of it. After all, we'll have plenty of leisure to arrange everything ourselves. We put the stores of food you sent in here. Your drugs are here. Soap, linen, here. Thank you, Meep. I made up the beds, the way Mr. Frank and Mr. Crailer said. Forgive me. I have to hurry. 
I've got to go to the other side of town and get some ration books for you. Ration books? If they see our names on ration books, they'll know we're here. There isn't anything. Don't worry, your names won't be on them. I'll be up later. Thank you, Meep. It's illegal, then? The ration books? We've never done anything illegal. We won't be living here exactly according to regulations. As Mr. Crailer reassures Mrs. Frank, he takes various small things, such as matches, soap, etc., from his pockets, handing them to her. This isn't the black market, Mrs. Frank. This is what we call the white market, helping all of the hundreds and hundreds who are hiding out in Amsterdam. The Carillion is heard playing the quarter hour before eight. Mr. Crailer looks at his watch. Anne stops at the window as she comes down the stairs. It's the Wester Torn! I must go. I must be out of here and downstairs in the office before the workmen get here. He starts for the stairs leading out. Meep or I, or both of us, will be up each day to bring you food and news and find out what your needs are. Tomorrow I'll get you a better bolt for the door at the foot of the stairs. It needs a bolt that you can throw yourself and open only at our signal. Oh, you'll tell them about the noise? I'll tell them. Goodbye, then, for the moment. I'll come up again, after the workmen leave. Goodbye, Mr. Crailer. How can we thank you? The others murmur their goodbyes. I never thought I'd live to see the day when a man like Mr. Frank would have to go into hiding. When you think. He breaks off, going out. Mr. Frank follows him down the steps, bolting the door after him. In the interval before he returns, Peter goes over to Margot, shaking hands with her. As Mr. Frank comes back up the steps, Mrs. Frank questions him anxiously. What did he mean about the noise? First, let us take off some of these clothes. They all start to take off garment after garment. On each of their coats, sweaters, blouses, suits, dresses is another yellow star of David. Mr. and Mrs. Frank are underdressed quite simply. The others wear several things, sweaters, extra dresses, bathrobes, aprons, nightgowns, etc. It's a wonder we weren't arrested, walking along the streets. Petronella with a fur coat in July, and that cat of Peter's crying all the way. As she is removing a pair of panties. A cat? Anne, please! It's all right, I've got on three more. She pulls off two more pairs of panties. Finally, as they have all removed their surplus clothes, they look to Mr. Frank, waiting for him to speak. Now, about the noise. While the men are in the building below, we must have complete quiet. Every sound can be heard down there, not only in the workrooms, but in the offices, too. The men come at about 8.30 and leave at about 5.30. So to be perfectly safe, from 8 in the morning until 6 in the evening, we must move only when it is necessary, and then in stockinged feet. We must not speak above a whisper. We must not run any water. We cannot use the sink or even, forgive me, the WC. The pipes go down through the workrooms. It would be heard. No trash. Mr. Frank stops abruptly as he hears the sound of marching feet from the street below. Everyone is motionless, paralyzed with fear. Mr. Frank goes quietly into the room on the right to look down out of the window. Anne runs after him, peering out with him. The tramping feet pass without stopping. The tension is relieved. Mr. Frank, followed by Anne, returns to the main room and resumes his instructions to the group. No trash must ever be thrown out, which might reveal that someone is living up here. Not even a potato paring. We must burn everything in the stove at night. This is the way we must live until it is over, if we are to survive. There is silence for a second. Until it is over. After six, we can move about. We can talk and laugh and have our supper and read and play games, just as we would at home. He looks at his watch. And now I think it would be wise if we all went to our rooms and were settled before eight o'clock. Mrs. Von Don, you and your husband will be upstairs. I regret that there's no place up there for Peter, but he will be here, near us. This will be our common room, where we'll meet to talk and eat and read, like one family. And where do you and Mrs. Frank sleep? This room is also our bedroom. That isn't it's right. We'll sleep here and you take the room upstairs. Please, I've thought this out for weeks. It's the best arrangement, the only arrangement. Never, never can we thank you. I don't know what would have happened to us if it hadn't been for Mr. Frank. You don't know how your husband helped me when I came to this country, knowing no one, not able to speak the language. I can never repay him for that. May I help you with your things? No, no. Come along, Lefi. You'll be all right, Peter? You're not afraid? Please, Mother. They start up the stairs to the attic room above. Mr. Frank turns to Mrs. Frank. 
You too must have some rest. You too must have some rest, Edith. You didn't close your eyes last night. Nor you, Margot. I slept, Father. Wasn't that funny? I knew it was the last night in my own bed, and yet I slept soundly. I'm glad, Anne. Now you'll be able to help me straighten things in here. To Mrs. Frank and Margot. Come with me. You and Margot rest in this room for the time being. He picks up their clothes, starting for the room on the right. You're sure? I could help, and Anne hasn't had her milk. I'll give it to her. To Anne and Peter. Anne, Peter, it's best that you take off your shoes now, before you forget. He leads the way to the room, followed by Margot. You're sure you're not tired, Anne? I feel fine. I'm going to help Father. Peter, I'm glad you are to be with us. Yes, Mrs. Frank. Mrs. Frank goes to join Mr. Frank and Margot. During the following scene, Mr. Frank helps Margot and Mrs. Frank to hang up their clothes. Then he persuades them both to lie down and rest. The Von Dons in their room above settle themselves. In the main room, Anne and Peter remove their shoes. Peter takes his cat out of the carrier. What's your cat's name? Mousy. 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 She picks up the cat, walking away with it. To Peter. I love cats. I have one. A darling little cat. But they made me leave her behind. I left some food and a note for the neighbors to take care of her. I'm going to miss her terribly. What is yours? A him or a her? He's a Tom. He doesn't like strangers. He takes the cat from her, putting it back in its carrier. Then I'll have to stop being a stranger, won't I? Is he fixed? Huh? Did you have him fixed? No. Oh, you ought to have him fixed to keep him from, you know, fighting. Where did you go to school? Jewish secondary. But that's where Margot and I go. I never saw you around. I used to see you, sometimes. You did? In the schoolyard. You were always in the middle of a bunch of kids. He takes a penknife from his pocket. Why didn't you ever come over? I'm sort of a lone wolf. He starts to rip off his Star of David. What are you doing? Taking it off? But you can't do that. They'll arrest you if you go out without your star. He tosses his knife on the table. Who's going out? Why, of course, you're right. Of course we don't need them anymore. She picks up his knife and starts to take her star off. I wonder what our friends will think when we don't show up today. I didn't have any dates with anyone. Oh, I did. I had a date with Yopi to go and play ping pong at her house. Do you know Yopi do all? No. Yopi's my best friend. I wonder what she'll think when she telephones and there's no answer. Probably she'll go over to the house. I wonder what she'll think. We left everything as if we'd suddenly been called away. Breakfast dishes in the sink. Beds not made. As she pulls off her star, the cloth underneath shows clearly the color and form of the star. Look, it's still there. Peter goes over to the stove with his star. What are you going to do with yours? Burn it. She starts to throw hers in and cannot. It's funny. I can't throw mine away. I don't know why. You can't throw? Something they branded you with? That they made you wear so they could spit on you? I know, I know. But after all, it is the Star of David, isn't it? In the bedroom, right, Margot and Mrs. Frank are lying down. Mr. Frank starts quietly out. Maybe it's different for a girl. Mr. Frank comes into the main room. Forgive me, Peter. Now let me see. We must find a bed for your cat. He goes to a cupboard. I'm glad you brought your cat. Anne was feeling so badly about hers. Getting a used small wash tub. Here we are. Will it be comfortable in that? Gathering up his things. Thanks. Opening the door of the room on the left. And here is your room. But I warn you, Peter, you can't grow any more. Not an inch, or you'll have to sleep with your feet out of the skylight. Are you hungry? No. We have some bread and butter. No, thank you. You can have it for luncheon, then. And tonight we will have a real supper, our first supper together. Thanks. Thanks. He goes into his room. During the following scene, he arranges his possessions in his new room. That's a nice boy, Peter. He's awfully shy, isn't he? You'll like him, I know. I certainly hope so, since he's the only boy I'm likely to see for months and months. Mr. Frank sits down, taking off his shoes. Anale, there's a box there. Will you open it? He indicates a carton on the couch. Anne brings it to the center table. 
In the street below, there is a sound of children playing. As she opens the carton, you know the way I'm going to think of it here? I'm going to think of it as a boarding house, a very peculiar summer boarding house, like the one that we, she breaks off as she pulls out some photographs, father, my movie stars. I was wondering where they were. I was looking for them this morning. And Queen Wilhelmina, how wonderful. There's something more. Go on, look further. He goes over to the sink, pouring a glass of milk from a thermos bottle, pulling out a pasteboard bound book. A diary! She throws her arms around her father. I've never had a diary, and I've always longed for one. She looks around the room. Pencil, 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 she starts down the stairs. I'm going down to the office to get a pencil. Anne, no! He goes after her, catching her by the arm and pulling her back. But there's no one in the building now. It doesn't matter. I don't want you ever to go beyond that door. Never? Not even at nighttime, when everyone is gone? Or on Sundays? Can I go down to listen to the radio? Never. I'm sorry. Anake, it isn't safe. No, you must never go beyond that door. For the first time, Anne realizes what going into hiding means. I see. It'll be hard, I know, but always remember this, Anake. There are no walls, there are no bolts, no locks that anyone can put on your mind. Meep will bring us books. We will read history, poetry, mythology. He gives her the glass of milk. Here's your milk. With his arm about her, they go over to the couch, sitting down side by side. As a matter of fact, between us, Anne, being here has certain advantages for you. For instance, you remember the battle you had with your mother the other day on the subject of overshoes? You said you'd rather die than wear overshoes, but in the end you had to wear them? Well now, you see, for as long as we are here, you will never have to wear overshoes. Isn't that good? And the coat that you inherited from Margot? You won't have to wear that anymore. And the piano? You won't have to practice on the piano. I tell you, this is going to be a fine life for you. Anne's panic is gone. Peter appears in the doorway of his room with a saucer in his hand. He is carrying his cat. I, I, I thought I'd better get some water for Mousy before... Of course. As he starts toward the sink, the Carillion begins to chime the hour of eight. He tiptoes to the window at the back and looks down at the street below. He turns to Peter, indicating in pantomime that it is too late. Peter starts back for his room. He steps on a creaking board. The three of them are frozen for a minute in fear. As Peter starts away again, Anne tiptoes over to him and pours some of the milk from her glass into the saucer for the cat. Peter squats on the floor, putting the milk before the cat. Mr. Frank gives Anne his fountain pen and then goes into the room at the right. For a second, Anne watches the cat. Then she goes over to the center table and opens her diary. In the room at the right, Mrs. Frank has set up quickly at the sound of the carillon. Mr. Frank comes in and sits down beside her on the settee, his arm comfortingly around her. Upstairs in the attic room, Mr. and Mrs. Von Don have hung their clothes in the closet and are now seated on the iron bed. Mrs. Von Don leans back exhausted. Mr. Von Don fans her with a newspaper. Anne starts to write in her diary. The lights dim out. The curtain falls. In the darkness, Anne's voice comes to us again, faintly at first, and then with growing strength. I expect I should be describing what it feels like to go into hiding, but I really don't know yet myself. I only know it's funny never to be able to go outdoors, never to breathe fresh air, never to run and shout and jump. It's the silence in the nights that frightens me most. Every time I hear a creak in the house, or a step on the street outside. I'm sure they're coming for us. The days aren't so bad. At least we know that Meep and Mr. Crailer are down there below us in the office. Our protectors, we call them. I asked Father what would happen to them if the Nazis found out they were hiding us. Pim said that they would suffer the same fate that we would. Imagine. They know this, and yet, when they come up here, they're always cheerful and gay as if there were nothing in the world to bother them. Friday, the 21st of August, 1942. Today I'm going to tell you our general news. Mother is unbearable. She insists on treating me like a baby, which I loathe. Otherwise, things are going better. 
The weather is... Anne's voice is fading out. The curtain rises on the scene. Scene 3. It is a little after 6 o'clock in the evening, two months later. Margot is in the bedroom at the right, studying. Mr. Von Don is lying down in the attic room above. The rest of the family is in the main room. Anne and Peter sit opposite each other at the center table, where they have been doing their lessons. Mrs. Frank is on the couch. Miss Mrs. Von Don is seated with her fur coat, on which she has been sewing, in her lap. None of them are wearing their shoes. Their eyes are on Mr. Frank, waiting for him to give them the signal which will release them from their day-long quiet. Mr. Frank, his shoes in his hands, stands looking down out of the window at the back, watching to be sure that all of the workmen have left the building below. After a few seconds of motionless silence, Mr. Frank turns from the window. Quietly to the group, it's safe now. The last workman has left. There is an immediate stir of relief. Anne's pent-up energy explodes. Whee! Anne! I'm first for the WC. She hurries off to the bathroom. Mrs. Frank puts on her shoes and starts up to the sink to prepare supper. Anne sneaks Peter's shoes from under the table and hides them behind her back. Mr. Frank goes into Margot's room. To Margot. Six o'clock. School's over. Margot gets up, stretching. Mr. Frank sits down to put on his shoes. In the main room, Peter tries to find his. Have you seen my shoes? Your shoes? You've taken them, haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about. You're going to be sorry. Am I? Peter goes after her. Anne, with his shoes in her hand, runs from him, dodging behind her mother. Anne, dear, wait till I get you. I'm waiting. Peter makes a lunge for her. They both fall to the floor. Peter pins her down, wrestling with her to get the shoes. Don't! Don't! Peter! Stop it! Ouch! Anne! Peter! Suddenly Peter becomes self-conscious. He grabs his shoes roughly and starts for his room. Peter, where are you going? Come dance with me. I tell you I don't know how. I'll teach you. I'm going to give Mousy his dinner. Can I watch? He doesn't like people around while he eats. Peter, please! No! He goes into his room. and slams his door after him. Anne, dear, I think you shouldn't play like that with Peter. It's not dignified. Who cares if it's dignified? I don't want to be dignified. Mr. Frank and Margot come from the room on the right. Margot goes to help her mother. Mr. Frank starts for the center table to correct Margot's school papers. To Anne. You complain that I don't treat you like a grown-up, but when I do, you resent it. I only want some fun, someone to laugh and clown with. After you've sat still all day and hardly moved, you've got to have some fun. I don't know what's the matter with that boy. He isn't used to girls. Give him a little time. Time? Isn't two months time? I could cry. Catching hold of Margot. Come on, Margot, dance with me. Come on, please. I have to help with supper. You know we're going to forget how to dance. When we get out, we won't remember a thing. She starts to sing and dance by herself. Mr. Frank takes her in his arms, waltzing with her. Mrs. Von Don comes in from the bathroom. Next, she looks around as she starts putting on her shoes. Where's Peter? As they are dancing. Where would he be? He hasn't finished his lessons, has he? His father will kill him if he catches him in there with that cat and his work not done. Mr. Frank and Anne finish their dance. They bow to each other with extravagant formality. Anne, get him out of there, will you? At Peter's door. Peter! Peter! Opening the door a crack. What is it? Your mother says to come out. I'm giving Mousy his dinner. You know what your father says. She sits on the couch, sewing on the lining of her fur coat. For heaven's sake, I haven't even looked at him since lunch. I'm just telling you, that's all. I'll feed him. I don't want you in there. Peter! Then give him his dinner and come right out, you hear? He comes back to the table. Anne shuts the door of Peter's room after her and disappears behind the curtain covering his closet. To Peter. Now is that any way to talk to your little girlfriend? Mother, for heaven's sake, will you please stop saying that? 
Look at him blush. Look at him. Please, I'm not. Anyway, let me alone, will you? He acts like it was something to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be ashamed of to have a little girlfriend. You're crazy. She's only 13. So what? And you're 16. Just perfect. Your father's 10 years older than I am. I warn you, Mr. Frank, if this war lasts much longer, we're going to be related and then... Mazel tov! Deliberately changing the conversation. I wonder where Meep is. She's usually so prompt. Suddenly, everything else is forgotten as they hear the sound of an automobile coming to a screeching stop in the street below. They are tense, motionless in their terror. The car starts away. A wave of relief sweeps over them. They pick up their occupations again. Anne flings open the door of Peter's room, making a dramatic entrance. She's dressed in Peter's clothes. Peter looks at her in fury. The others are amused. Good evening, everyone. Forgive me if I don't stay. She jumps up on a chair. I have a friend waiting for me in there. Friend Tom, Tom Cat. Some people say that we look alike, but Tom has the most beautiful whiskers, and I have only a little fuzz. I am hoping, in time. All right, Mrs. Quack Quack. Outrage jumping down. Peter! I heard about you. How you talked so much in class they called you Mrs. Quack Quack. How Mr. Smitter made you write a composition. Quack, quack, said Mrs. Quack, quack. Well, go on. Tell him the rest. How it was so good, he read it aloud to the class and then read it to all his other classes. Quack, 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 quack. Anne pulls off the coat and trousers. You are the most intolerable, insufferable boy I've ever met. She throws the clothes down the stairwell. Peter goes down after them. Quack, quack, quack. That's right, Anike, give it to him. With all the boys in the world. Why, I had to get locked up with one like you. Quack, quack, quack. And from now on, stay out of my room. Peter passes her. Anne puts out her foot, tripping him. He picks himself up and goes on into his room. Anne, dear, your hair. She feels Anne's forehead. You're warm. Are you feeling all right? Please, mother. She goes over to the center table, slipping into her shoes, following her. You haven't a fever, have you? Pulling away. No, no. You know we can't call a doctor here ever. There's only one thing to do. Watch carefully. Prevent an illness before it comes. Let me see your tongue. Mother, this is perfectly absurd. Anne, dear, don't be such a baby. Let me see your tongue. As Anne refuses, Mrs. Frank appeals to Mr. Frank. Otto, you hear your mother, Anne? Anne flicks out her tongue for a second, then turns away. Come on, open up. As Anne opens her mouth very wide. You seem all right, but perhaps an aspirin. For heaven's sake, don't give that child any pills. I waited for 15 minutes this morning for her to come out of the WC. I was washing my hair. I think there's nothing the matter with our Anne that a ride on her bike or a visit with her friend, Hopi Deval, wouldn't cure. Isn't that so, Anne? Mr. Von Don comes down into the room. From outside, we hear faint sounds of bombers going over and a burst of ack ack. Meep not come yet? The workman just left a little while ago. What's for dinner tonight? Beans. Not again. Poor Putty, I know. But what can we do? That's all that Meep brought us. Mr. Von Don starts to pace, his hands behind his back. Anne follows behind him, imitating him. We are now in what is known as the bean cycle. Beans boiled, beans and casserole, beans with strings, beans without strings. Peter has come out of his room. He slides into his place at the table, becoming immediately absorbed in his studies. To Peter, I saw you in there playing with your cat. He just went in for a second, putting his coat away. He's been out here all the time doing his lessons. Looking up from the papers, and you got an excellent in your history paper today, and very good in Latin. Sitting beside him, how about algebra? I'll have to make a confession. Up until now, I've managed to stay ahead of you in algebra. Today, you caught up with me. We'll leave it to Margot to correct. Isn't algebra vile, Pim? Vile? How did I do? Excellent, 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 excellent. You should have used the subjunctive here. Should I? I thought, look here, I didn't use it here. 
The two become absorbed in the papers. Mrs. Von Don, may I try on your coat? No, Anne. Give it to Anne. It's all right, but careful with it. Anne puts it on and struts with it. My father gave me that the year before he died. He always bought the best that money could buy. Mrs. Von Don, did you have a lot of boyfriends before you were married? Anne, that's a personal question. It's not courteous to ask personal questions. Oh, I don't mind. Our house was always swarming with boys. When I was a girl, we had... Oh, God, not again. <laughs> Shut up. Without a pause to Anne, Mr. Von Don mimics Mrs. Von Don speaking the first few words in unison with her. One summer, we had a big house in Hilversum. The boys came buzzing round like bees around a jam pot, and when I was sixteen, we were wearing our skirts very short those days, and I had good-looking legs. She pulls up her skirt, going to Mr. Frank. I still have them. I may not be as pretty as I used to be, but I still have my legs. How about it, Mr. Frank? All right, all right, we see them. I'm not asking you. I'm asking Mr. Frank. Mother, for heaven's sake. Oh, I embarrass you, do I? Well, I just hope the girl you marry has as good. Then to Anne, my father used to worry about me, with so many boys hanging round. He told me, if any of them gets fresh, you say to him, Remember, Mr. So-and-so, remember, I'm a lady. Remember, Mr. So-and-so, remember, I'm a lady. She gives Mrs. Von Don her coat. Look at you talking that way in front of her. Don't you know she puts it all down in that diary? So, if she does, I'm only telling the truth. Anne stretches out, putting her ear to the floor, listening to what is going on below. The sound of the bombers fades away. Mrs. Frank setting the table. Would you mind, Peter, if I moved you over to the couch? Me must have the radio on. Peter picks up his papers, going over to the couch beside Mrs. Von Don. Accusingly to Peter. Haven't you finished yet? No. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. All right, all right, I'm a dunce. I'm a hopeless case. Why do I go on? You're not hopeless. Don't talk that way. It's just that you haven't anyone to help you, like the girls have. Maybe you could help him, Mr. Frank? I'm sure that his father... Not me. I can't do anything with him. He won't listen to me. You go ahead, if you want. What about it, Peter? Shall we make our school co-educational? Kissing Mr. Frank. You're an angel, Mr. Frank. An angel. I don't know why I didn't meet you before I met that one there. Here, sit down, Mr. Frank. She forces him down on the couch beside Peter. Now, Peter, you listen to Mr. Frank. It might be better for us to go into Peter's room. Peter jumps up eagerly, leading the way. That's right. You go in there, Peter. You listen to Mr. Frank. Mr. Frank is a highly educated man. As Mr. Frank is about to follow Peter into his room, Mrs. Frank stops him and wipes the lipstick from his lips. Then she closes the door after them. On the floor listening. Shh! I can hear a man's voice talking. To Anne. Isn't it bad enough here without your sprawling all over the place? If you didn't smoke so much, you wouldn't be so bad-tempered. Am I smoking? Do you see me smoking? Don't tell me you've used up all those cigarettes. One package. Meep only brought me one package. It's a filthy habit anyway. It's a good time to break yourself. Oh, stop it, please. You're smoking up all our money. You know that, don't you? Will you shut up? During this, Mrs. Frank and Margot have studiously kept their eyes down. But Anne, seated on the floor, has been following the discussion interestedly. Mr. Von Don turns to see her staring up at him. And what are you staring at? I never heard grown-ups quarrel before. I thought only children quarreled. This isn't a quarrel. It's a discussion. And I never heard children so rude before. I? Rude? Yes. Anne, will you get me my knitting? Anne goes to get it. I must remember when Meep comes to ask her to bring me some more wool. Margot, going to her room. I need some hairpins and some soap. I made a list. She goes into her bedroom to get the list. Have you some library books for Meep when she comes? It's a wonder that Meep has a life of her own, the way we make her run errands for us. Please, Meep, get me some starch. Please take my hair out and have it cut. Tell me all the latest news, Meep. She goes over, kneeling on the couch beside Mrs. Von Don. Did you know she was engaged? 
His name is Dirk, and Meep's afraid the Nazis will ship him off to Germany to work in one of their war plants. That's what they're doing with some of the young Dutchmen. They pick them up off the streets. Don't you ever get tired of talking? Suppose you try keeping still for five minutes. Just five minutes. He starts to pace again. Again, Anne follows him, mimicking him. Mrs. Frank jumps up and takes her by the arm up to the sink and gives her a glass of milk. Come here, Anne. It's time for your glass of milk. Talk, talk, talk. Never heard such a child. Where is my? Every evening it's the same talk, talk, talk. He looks around. Where is my? What are you looking for? My pipe. Have you seen my pipe? What good's a pipe? You haven't got any tobacco. At least I'll have something to hold in my mouth. Opening Margot's bedroom door. Margot, have you seen my pipe? It was on the table last night. Anne puts her glass of milk on the table and picks up his pipe, hiding it behind her back. I know, I know. Anne, did you see my pipe? Anne! Anne, Mr. Von Dunn is speaking to you. Am I allowed to talk now? Oh, you're the most aggravating. The trouble with you is you've been spoiled. What you need is a good old-fashioned spanking. Remember, Mr. So-and-so, remember, I'm a lady. She thrusts the pipe into his mouth, then picks up her glass of milk. He's restraining himself with difficulty. Why aren't you nice and quiet like your sister Margot? Why do you have to show off all the time? Let me give you a little advice, young lady. Men don't like that kind of thing in a girl. You know that? A man likes a girl who will listen to him once in a while. A domestic girl who will keep her house shining for her husband, who loves to cook and sew and... I'd cut my throat first. I'd open my veins. I'm going to be remarkable. I'm going to Paris. Paris. To study music and art. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be a famous dancer or singer or something wonderful. She makes a wide gesture, spilling the glass of milk on the fur coat in Mrs. Von Don's lap. Margot rushes quickly over with a towel. Anne tries to brush the milk off with her skirt. Now look what you've done, you clumsy little fool. My beautiful fur coat my father gave me. I'm so sorry. What do you care? It isn't yours. So go on, ruin it. Do you know what that coat costs? Do you? And now look at it. Look at it. I'm very, very sorry. I could kill you for this. I could just kill you. Mrs. Von Don goes up the stairs, clutching the coat. Mr. Von Don starts after her. Petronella. Lefay, Lefay, come back. The supper, come back. Anne, you must not behave in that way. It was an accident. Anyone can have an accident. I don't mean that. I mean the answering back. You must not answer back. They are our guests. We must always show the greatest courtesy to them. We're all living under terrible tension. She stops as Margot indicates that Von Don can hear. When he is gone, she continues. That's why we must control ourselves. You don't hear Margot getting in arguments with them, do you? Watch Margot. She's always courteous with them, never familiar. She keeps her distance, and they respect her for it. Try to be like Margot. And have them walk all over me the way they do her? No thanks. I'm not afraid that anyone is going to walk all over you, Anne. I'm afraid for other people, that you'll walk on them. I don't know what happens to you, Anne. You are wild, self-willed. If I had ever talked to my mother as you talked to me, things have changed. People aren't like that anymore. Yes, mother. No, mother. Anything you say, mother. I've got to fight things out for myself. Make something of myself. It isn't necessary to fight to do it. Margot doesn't fight, and isn't she? Margot! 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 That's all I hear from everyone. How wonderful Margot is. Why aren't you like Margot? Oh, come on, Anne. Don't be so. Everything she does is right, and everything I do is wrong. I'm the goat around here. You're all against me, and you, worst of all. She rushes off into her room and throws herself down on the settee, stifling her sobs. Mrs. Frank sighs and starts toward the stove. Let's put the soup on the stove, if there's anyone who cares to eat. Margot, will you take the bread out? Margot gets the bread from the cupboard. I don't know how we can go on living this way. I can't say a word to Anne. She flies at me. You know, Anne. In half an hour, she'll be out of here, laughing and joking. Anne, she makes a motion upwards, indicating the Von Duns. I told your father it wouldn't work, but no, no. He had to ask them. He said. He owed it to him, he said. Well, he knows now that I was right. These quarrels, this bickering. With a warning look. Shush, shush. The buzzer for the door sounds. Mrs. Frank gasps, startled. Every time I hear that sound, my heart stops.
the diary of out. Scene four. Starting for Peter's door. It's Meep, she knocks at the door. Father! Mr. Frank comes quickly from Peter's room. Thank you, Margot, as he goes down the steps to open the outer door. Has everyone his list? I'll get my books, giving her mother a list. Here's your list. Margot goes into her and Anne's bedroom on the right. Anne sits up, hiding her tears as Margot comes in. Meep's here. Margot picks up her books and goes back. Anne hurries over to the mirror, smoothing her hair. Is it Meep? Yes, father's gone down to let her in. At last I'll have some cigarettes. To Mr. Von Don. I can't tell you how unhappy I am about Mrs. Von Don's coat. Anne should never have touched it. She'll be all right. Is there anything I can do? Don't worry. He turns to meet Meep, but it is not Meep who comes up the steps. It is Mr. Crailer, followed by Mr. Frank. Their faces are grave. Anne comes from the bedroom. Peter comes from his room. Mr. Crailer! How are you, Mr. Crailer? This is a surprise. When Mr. Crailer comes, the sun begins to shine. Meep is coming? Not tonight. Crailer goes to Margot and Mrs. Frank and Anne, shaking hands with them. Wouldn't you like a cup of coffee? Or better still, will you have supper with us? Mr. Crailer has something to talk over with us. Something has happened, he says, which demands an immediate decision. What is it? Mr. Crailer sits down on the couch. As he talks, he takes bread, cabbages, milk, etc. from his briefcase, giving them to Margot and Anne to put away. Usually when I come up here, I try to bring you some bit of good news. What's the use of telling you the bad news when there's nothing that you can do about it? But today something has happened. Dirk, Meeps Dirk, you know, came to me just now. He tells me that he has a Jewish friend living near him, a dentist. He says he's in trouble. He begged me, could I do anything for this man? Could I find him a hiding place? So I've come to you. I know it's a terrible thing to ask of you, living as you are, but would you take him in with you? Of course we will. It'll be just for a night or two, until I find some other place. This happened so suddenly that I didn't know where to turn. Where is he? Downstairs in the office. Good, bring him up. His name is Dussel. John Dussel. Dussel? I think I know him. I'll get him. He goes quickly down the steps and out. Mr. Frank suddenly becomes conscious of the others. Forgive me, I spoke without consulting you, but I knew you'd feel as I do. There's no reason for you to consult anyone. This is your place. You have a right to do exactly as you please. The only thing I feel, there's so little food as it is, and to take in another person. Peter turns away, ashamed of his father. We can stretch the food a little. It's only for a few days. You want to make a bet? I think it's fine to have him. But, Otto, where are you going to put him? Where? He can have my bed. I can sleep on the floor. I wouldn't mind. That's good of you, Peter, but your room's too small, even for you. I have a much better idea. I'll come in here with you and Mother, and Margot can take Peter's room, and Peter can go in our room with Mr. Dussel. That's right. We could do that. No, Margot. You mustn't sleep in that room. Neither you nor Anne. Mousy has caught some rats in there. Peter's brave. He doesn't mind. Then how about this? I'll come in here with you and Mother, and Mr. Dussel can have my bed. No, no, no. Margo will come in here with us, and he can have her bed. It's the only way. Margo, bring your things in here. Help her, Anne. Margo hurries into her room to get her things. Why, Margo? Why can't I come in here? Because it wouldn't be proper for Margo to sleep with a... Please, Anne, don't argue. Please. Anne starts slowly away. You don't mind sharing your room with Mr. Dussel, do you, Anne? No, no, of course not. Good. Anne goes off into her bedroom, helping Margot. Mr. Frank starts to search in the cupboards. Where's the cognac? It's there. But, Otto, I was saving it in case of illness. I think we couldn't find a better time to use it. Peter, will you get five glasses for me? Peter goes for the glasses. Margot comes out of her bedroom, carrying her possessions, which she hangs behind a curtain in the main room. Mr. Frank finds the cognac and pours it into the five glasses that Peter brings him. Mr. Von Don stands looking on sourly. Mrs. Von Don comes downstairs and looks around at all the bustle. What's happening? What's going on? Someone's moving in with us. In here? You're joking. It's only for a night or two until Mr. Crailer finds him another place. Yeah, yeah. 
Mr. Frank hurries over as Mr. Crayler and Dussel come up. Dussel is a man in his late fifties, meticulous, finicky, bewildered now. He wears a raincoat. He carries a briefcase, stuffed full, and a small medicine case. Come in, Mr. Dussel. This is Mr. Frank. Mr. Otto Frank? Yes. Let me take your things. He takes the hat and briefcase, but Dussel clings to his medicine case. This is my wife, Edith, Mr. and Mrs. Von Don, their son, Peter, and my daughters, Margot and Anne. Dussel shakes hands with everyone. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Thank you all. Mr. Dussel, I leave you in good hands. Oh, Dirk's coat. Dussel hurriedly takes off the raincoat, giving it to Mr. Crayler. Underneath is his white dentist jacket with a yellow star of David on it. To Mr. Crayler, what can I say to thank you? To Dussel, Mr. Crayler and Meep, they're our lifeline. Without them, we couldn't live. Please, please, you make us seem very heroic. It isn't that at all. We simply don't like the Nazis. To Mr. Frank, who offers him a drink. No, thanks. Then going on. We don't like their methods. We don't like... I know, I know. No one's going to tell us Dutchmen what to do with our damn Jews. Pay no attention to Mr. Frank. I'll be up tomorrow to see that they're treating you right. Don't trouble to come down again. Peter will bolt the door after me, won't you, Peter? Yes, sir. Thank you, Peter. I'll do it. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mr. Crayler. We'll see you tomorrow, etc., etc. Mr. Crayler goes out with Mr. Frank. Mrs. Frank gives each one of the grown-ups a glass of cognac. Please, Mr. Dussel, sit down. Mr. Dussel sinks into a chair. Mrs. Frank gives him a glass of cognac. I'm dreaming. I know it. I can't believe my eyes. Mr. Otto, Frank here. You were not in Switzerland, then? A woman told me. She said she'd gone to your house. The door was open. Everything was in disorder. Dishes in the sink. She said she found a piece of paper in the wastebasket with an address scribbled on it, an address in Zurich. She said you must have escaped to Zurich. Father put that there purposely, just so people would think that very thing. And you've been here all the time? All the time, ever since July, Anne speaks to her father as he comes back. It worked, Pim, the address you left. Mr. Dussel says that people believe we escaped to Switzerland. I'm glad, and now let's have a little drink to welcome Mr. Dussel. Before they drink, Mr. Dussel bolts his drink. Mr. Frank smiles and raises his glass. To Mr. Dussel, welcome. We're very honored to have you with us. To Mr. Dussel, welcome. The Von Dons murmur a welcome. The grown-ups drink. Um, that was good. Did Mr. Crayler warn you that you won't get much to eat here? You can imagine, three ration books among the seven of us, and now you make eight? Peter walks away, humiliated. Outside a street organ is heard dimly. Mr. Von Don, you don't realize what is happening outside that you should warn me of a thing like that. You don't realize what's going on. As Mr. Von Don starts his characteristic pacing, Dussel turns to speak to the others. Right here in Amsterdam, every day, hundreds of Jews disappear. They surround a block and search house by house. Children come home from school to find their parents gone. Hundreds are being deported. People that you and I know, the Hollensteins, the Vessels, Oh, no, no! They get their call-up notice. Come to the Jewish theater on such and such a day and hour. Bring only what you can carry in a rucksack. And if you refuse the call-up notice, then they come and drag you from your home and ship you off to Mauthausen, the death camp. We didn't know that things had got so much worse. Forgive me for speaking so. Do you know the Duvals? What's become of them? Their daughter, Hopi, and I are in the same class. Hopi is my best friend. They are gone. Gone? With all the others. Oh no, not Hobie. She turns away in tears. Mrs. Frank motions to Margot to comfort her. Margot goes to Anne, putting her arms comfortingly around her. There were some people called Wagner. They lived near us? Mr. Frank's interrupting with a glance at Anne. I think we should put this off until later. We all have many questions we want to ask, but I'm sure that Mr. Dussel would like to get settled before supper. Thank you. I would. I brought very little with me, given him his hat and briefcase. I'm sorry we can't give you a room alone, but I hope you won't be too uncomfortable. We've had to make strict rules here, a schedule of hours. We'll tell you after supper. Anne, would you like to take Mr. Dussel to his room? Controlling her tears. If you'll come with me, Mr. Dussel, she starts for her room, shaking hands with each in turn. Forgive me if I haven't really expressed my gratitude to all of you. 
This has been such a shock to me. I'd always thought of myself as Dutch. I was born in Holland. My father was born in Holland. And my grandfather. And now, after all these years... He breaks off. If you'll excuse me. Thistle gives a little bow and hurries off after Anne. Mr. Frank and the others are subdued. Turning on the light. Well, here we are. Thistle looks around the room. In the main room, Margot speaks to her mother. The news sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? It's so different from what Mr. Crailer tells us. Mr. Crailer says things are improving. I like it better the way Crailer tells it. They resume their occupations quietly. Peter goes off into his room. In Anne's room, Anne turns to Dussel. You're going to share the room with me. I'm a man who's always lived alone. I haven't had to adjust myself to others. I hope you'll bear with me until I learn. Let me help you. She takes his briefcase. Do you always live all alone? Have you no family at all? No one. He opens his medicine case and spreads his bottles on the dressing table. How dreadful. You must be terribly lonely. I'm used to it. I don't think I could ever get used to it. Didn't you even have a pet, a cat, or a dog? I have an allergy for fur-bearing animals. They give me asthma. Oh, dear. Peter has a cat. Here? He has it here? Yes, but we hardly ever see it. He keeps it in his room all the time. I'm sure it will be all right. Let us hope so. He takes some pills to fortify himself. That's Margot's bed, where you're going to sleep. I sleep on the sofa there, indicating the clothes hooks on the wall. We cleared these off for your things, she goes over to the window. The best part about this room, you can look down and see a bit of the street in the canal. There's a houseboat. You can see the end of it. A bargeman lives there with his family. They have a baby, and he's just beginning to walk, and I'm so afraid he's going to fall into the canal some day. I watch him. Your father spoke of a schedule. Oh, yes. It's mostly about the times we have to be quiet, and times for the W.C. You can use it now if you like. No, thank you. I suppose you think it's awful, my talking about a thing like that, but you don't know how important it, it can get to be, especially when you're frightened. About this room, the way Margot and I did, she had it to herself in the afternoons for studying, reading, lessons, you know, and I took the mornings. Would that be all right with you? I'm not at my best in the morning. You stay here in the mornings, then. I'll take the room in the afternoons. Tell me, when you're in here, what happens to me? Where am I spending my time? In there, with all the people? Yes. I see. I see. We have supper at half past six. Then, if you don't mind, I like to lie down quietly for ten minutes before eating. I find it helps the digestion. Of course. I hope I'm not going to be too much of a bother to you. I seem to be able to get everyone's back up. Dussel lies down on the sofa, curled up, his back to her. I always get along very well with children. My patients all bring their children to me, because they know I get on well with them. So don't you worry about that. Anne leans over him, taking his hand and shaking it gratefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dussel. The lights dim to darkness. The curtain falls on the scene. Anne's voice comes to us faintly at first, and then with increasing power. And yesterday, I finished Sissy Van Marksveld's latest book. I think she is a first-class writer. I shall definitely let my children read her. Monday, the 21st of September, 1942. Mr. Dussel and I had another battle yesterday. Yes, Mr. Dussel. According to him, nothing, I repeat, nothing is right about me. My appearance, my character, my manners. While he was going on at me, I thought, sometime I'll give you such a smack that you'll fly right up to the ceiling. Why is it that every grown-up thinks he knows the way to bring up children, particularly the grown-ups that never had any? I keep wishing that Peter was a girl instead of a boy, that I would have someone to talk to. Margot's a darling, but she takes everything too seriously. To pause for a moment on the subject of Mrs. Von Don, I must tell you that her attempts to flirt with father are getting her nowhere. Pim, thank goodness, won't play. As she is saying the last lines, the curtain rises on the darkened scene. Anne's voice fades out. 